Welcome to another CO2 Monday. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews, and I'm super excited for the conversation we're going to have today. I got a great guest, Lars Jensen from Advancer. I've been on many of Lars' trainings, which is really cool because he is a really knowledgeable in CO2, has been helping technicians and engineers from all over the world yeah. um, with CO2. And my goal here is to really have a great conversation to help you all out uh, when you're installing, servicing, or, uh, you know, um, commissioning a CO2 system. If you have any questions, you can use the chat box. If you want to unmute yourself or raise your hand, you're more than happy or more than welcome to do that. So let's get it started. Hey, Lars, how you doing, brother? Hey, Trevor. Thank you uh, for inviting me for this. Um, actually, I'm thinking it's a quite cool thing you're doing, promoting CO2. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, allowing a lot of people to get the knowledge in CO2. Uh, I'm super happy for that because that was one of uh, one of my uh, focus points to start an uh, engineering degree. That was to make, uh, so to say, uh, the world a greener place. Yeah. And uh, for sure, refrigeration is one of uh, one of the important uh, topics areas to. Uh, to help uh, the world do that. Yeah, I love it. And, and I really appreciate you taking the time. It's I know it's uh, in the evening where you're at. Why don't we uh, let everyone know, why don't you give a little bit of background when you started in CO2, your refrigeration journey to where you're at now? It's a good idea. Um, as I mentioned a little bit before, uh, my engineering degree, it's uh, the education I took is called uh, Marine Engineer. Uh, it's kind of a unique uh, education you have uh, here in Denmark. It's, um, it's a bachelor degree in, um, in poly, in the polytechnical field. So we have a little bit of knowledge in, uh, in all the technical uh, fields. And uh, after my education, I uh, started in a contracting company here in Denmark. And uh, after I've been there in uh, one or two years, I actually started to sell advanced uh, racks uh, for that company to wow. uh, mostly industrial applications. Nice. So that was where, uh, where my, uh, my journey for CO2 started. And uh, I can be honest to say in the start, I didn't, uh, I didn't get any of thing, didn't get any of it. <laughs> the high pressure valve, uh, what the heck was that? The gas yeah. bypass valve, okay, what is that? What's yeah. that thing doing here? Yeah. Yeah, I know all about it. I, I felt the same way. And I've been, I was in refrigeration for like 12, 13 years. And then I get into CO2 transcritical booster and I'm like, oh man, like what is this? What's happening inside the system? And it just takes time to learn this stuff. So, so it's really good uh, that we're going to talk about this today. So now what is your role with Advancer? My role now is, uh, I don't know if I would say it's uh, difficult to describe. Uh, actually, when I started uh, in Advanza, I was actually uh, being interviewed for a position in the sales department. And uh, I kind of refused that. And um, then we came to the conclusion that maybe the after sales uh, department was a good place. And uh, when I started at Advanza, my uh, my main job was to help in our, we have a service mail where all our customers can write technical questions, they can get help and so on. And we have a service phone uh, with the same purpose. And then I did a lot of uh, traveling, helping our customers uh, with commissioning. Uh, yeah, mainly in, uh, in Europe. We had a concept uh, at that time, also because SU2 then was, uh, was still quite new in uh, Europe. Uh, where every new uh, contractor that we sold to, we gave them uh, commissioning help for free, traveled out, helped them uh, starting up uh, their system. And that just gave a ton of uh, knowledge to me, traveling out to, to people in Holland, to Northern of uh, Sweden, uh, also see the many different climate zones uh, that CO2 could, uh, could work in. Yeah. And uh, now it's mainly uh, training that I'm doing. I'm also uh, uh, the main person in our department handling um, uh, retrofit uh, jobs, uh, quoting retrofit uh, to our customers. I'm still doing a little bit of uh, traveling, but that is uh, mainly for new components, uh, field tests, and so on. 
Oh, great. So let's talk about when you first started and you were doing those, uh, you know, the commissioning and the start off because you were new to CO2 at that point, probably getting in, you know, uh, learning a lot along the way, because that's how I've done it too. You got to learn at some point. So what are some of the things that you were noticing when you were going out to these commissioning sites? Because I'm sure a lot of the technicians you were working with were new to CO2 as well. Exactly. And that was uh, the point that uh, in the start, I was new to CO2. Of course, I had some knowledge and also some uh, background, theoretical knowledge. And then I think uh, one of uh, the strong cards I had on the hand was uh, I was quite into controls because it's not a secret that a controller for CO2 is a little bit more complicated than, than normally controls for, for other systems. Yeah. I think that was an advantage to me. And then uh, I really had some amazing uh, colleagues uh, when I started, and of course, uh, still have it now, that could uh, help me uh, uh, quite fast into it. And then, of course, in, this, uh, in the start, it was uh, mainly smaller systems. Uh, I traveled out to uh, smaller supermarket uh, systems and so on. Yeah, yeah. No, so that, and that's the best experience right there, getting out with the technicians, seeing that system installed, probably finding different issues along the way, uh, maybe piping or controls is a big one. I really like that you said that because this is something I've been talking with technicians for years and years and years, be like, you gotta start understanding the electronics of refrigeration because it's coming in all sides of the industry, not only with CO2, but you'll see it in VRF systems or VR, VAV or, heat pumps or just standard condensing units now you're seeing a lot more electronics <laughs> and when you get into co2 well it's all electronics and this is something that you need to learn where do you get the background in the electronics i think that was mainly from uh, from my engineering degree there we had uh, around one year uh, where we uh, where we had a course called uh, automation and that was mainly uh, plc uh, programming a little bit of uh, HMI uh, programming, uh, small displays and so on. Uh, that was where, where I got the main knowledge. And it was a really good uh, way to get the knowledge when you are getting it at a, at a theoretical level, because then it's much easier to convert to different kinds of controllers. Um, I know here in Denmark, uh, the technicians that is getting educated uh, as a technician, um, they are getting, for example, a Danfoss controller to their availability. But then you're getting more into knowledge with that specific uh, brand instead of uh, one level deeper. So that was at least uh, for me a good way uh, uh, to do it. Yeah, and, and this is what I talk about to a lot of technicians too. Learn one really good. If you can get a controller and learn that one really, really good, what it'll, it'll help you with is when you get to another one, you, like another brand or another manufacturer's controller, a lot there's going to be a lot of similarities, you know, and they might have different um, maybe um, descriptions or different wording and maybe different buttons you need to press. But the theory behind it, that base theory is going to be the same. Exactly. And uh, I don't think it's a secret that, that they are looking uh, above each other's uh, shoulders, uh, the different uh, manufacturers. Yeah. If there's some uh, nice uh, functions or features, maybe they are trying to, to integrate it uh, in their own systems. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if I should make a recommendation, it's really to get into, into the controller, uh, to the communication also between the controller and the evaporator controllers, mm -hmm. uh, get a good uh, understanding of it. It's a really, uh, it's a really helpful uh, on the journey to be better in CO2. Yeah, and, and that's one of the big things that I talk to a lot of technicians who have installed like 50 or 80 or 100 stores. Um, they're like, we, I need to get my techs to understand the control size because when you do run into an issue in a, a CO2 system, well, you're going to be going to the controller and you're going to be taking a look and you want to look at the pressures and the temperatures and the controllers and understand how to navigate those controllers. So that's a, that's a great tip uh, there. Um, so you did that for quite a few years and you moved your way into the training side of Advancer and training on CO2. And I've been to many of your trainings, which has been pretty awesome. I'm pretty grateful to have the opportunity to train with you. Why don't we talk about that, that transition and how that, did that work going from, you know, 
uh, the field support, commissioning, to now more of the lead trainer or the training side of Advancer? I think it was um, completely random, uh, more or less, and, uh, and then not uh, anyways. But uh, it started uh, during uh, the pandemic, uh, or actually a little bit before the pandemic, we had started a little bit uh, in the factory to invite uh, different companies and also people that could sign up for uh, training sessions and normally two or three, uh, two or three day uh, training session. And I think we had the one or two uh, uh, runs on that and then the pandemic uh, came. Then we uh, sat down and thought about, okay, uh, what should we do now? We talked about a lot of different uh, things. And then I said, okay, uh, I can uh, kind of take uh, the lead on this one. And uh, then I had a good uh, body that uh, joined me, uh, Mass, my colleague, who you probably also know from, uh, yeah. from the trainings. Then we uh, sat down and actually talked about, okay, what is, what is important, uh, uh, what kind of information is it is important that we are giving uh, giving to the participants? Because you know we started uh, talking about all the cool and all the new things. Okay, that was just what we uh, what we should uh, promote and tell about. Uh, for example, ejectors, uh, big heat pumps, uh, pump systems, uh, and so on. But then we talked about okay, maybe we should uh, turn it around. And start with all the basics, um, mm. and then of course it's not, it's not a it's not a secret that we also helped ourselves uh, because as you know our first module that was uh, mainly around to to understand our documentation how we are building up uh, the PNI diagrams, how we are linking uh, the electrical diagram into the PNI diagram, uh, connecting or. Yeah, connecting the wire numbers both to the PNI diagram and to the electrical diagram. Mm -hmm. That was where we started. And then we just took a theoretical walkthrough the next uh, four modules uh, around the rack just to give some uh, some basic information. Uh, and then we decided to to mix that up with some uh, yeah, both some uh, histories and so on from from the real world. So it's also a little bit uh, not only a theory but also something from from reality. And then we actually decided to, to walk through the, the complete commissioning uh, process. Of course, it's a, it's a bit difficult to, to just to give that on a PowerPoint presentation, but yeah. I think we got all the, all the uh, main or major uh, points covered in these uh, modules. And that, uh, I think also that is where we can see uh, when we are looking back now, that is where we had the most participants uh, because that was just uh, spot on. Then we made, uh, I think it was uh, one module around how to service, uh, what to look at. Uh, and I can say already now that there will come more modules in that direction. And we are working on, uh, on three new modules awesome. where we are talking a bit more uh, around the new technology. Uh, what I started to mention around ejector uh, racks, big heat pumps, uh, big pump systems uh, for for quick uh, quick freezes and so on. Yeah, that, that is awesome. And because I did sit on many of those modules, which were really fun, and I learned a ton. Um, so you started out and you did factory training. Let's talk about your factory training. Are you doing any factory training yet, or still still no factory training yet? We are uh, we uh, kick started again here. Uh, and was it uh, two months ago? We had the first uh, class uh, this year. We also had some, uh, I think it was uh, four or five classes in the autumn. Then we had a small uh, pandemic. Uh, I think it was a third or fourth wave uh, coming back uh, to Denmark. We needed to take uh, two months off. But then we started again. Um, and we, we started uh, mainly with, uh, with the larger partners that we could see where it made uh, really much sense, where we could see, okay, uh, it will make sense that uh, bringing this uh, company to, uh, to a training in our training center. And actually we're having a training session uh, this week as well, awesome. here Wednesday and uh, Thursday with a Danish uh, contract uh, focusing mainly on uh, the pharmaceutical industry. 
Oh, cool. So, uh, and so when yeah. you do the in-person training, what, what are some of the things that you want to teach the, either the technicians or the, the, the people that will be servicing and working on them uh, in your location, in your facility? Depending on their level, uh, of course, but um, I'll just mention the standard setup uh, we have for these uh, trainings. That is uh, two-day training normally. Uh, where the first day we are focusing um, mainly on all the basic uh, parts, a little bit like uh, the online technical training. Uh, the way we do it is that we are, we are walking through a big uh, P&I diagram. We can easily spend uh, two, two and a half hours yeah. talking about uh, each component. Okay, what is the function of each component? Um, how does this component affect the other components? Uh, talk about all these things. Then uh, we are transferring a bit uh, to the controller, as we talked about uh, earlier. We are making a full uh, walkthrough in the controller, uh, especially focusing on all uh, the safety parameters, uh, the pressure software, pressure switches, uh, software safeties. All the things that we have talked about uh, in the PI diagram, uh, we are looking at in the controller. Then we are moving. Uh, a bit over to what we are calling a supervisor uh, controller navigation, so to say, where we are putting a, a bit more knowledge around how to, to make sure that, that the compressor is having a good life. I know that you are also uh, a big fan of uh, teaching that. Um, but we are here we are mainly educating uh, the participants in going into the controller uh, look at, okay, how many running hours do the compressors have compared to each other? How many uh, starts uh, does the compressor have per running hour? How to look at uh, the conditions around uh, the compressor and how to evaluate uh, these uh, conditions. Especially uh, my, uh, my main focus point is the suction superheat of uh, the empty compressors. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, on our racks, uh, and I think uh, just, to, just to give a small uh, background here, uh, almost in all our racks, we have a coil in, uh, in the middle pressure receiver uh, where all the suction gases to the LT compressors are coming through. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that gives that result that in all our uh, LT compressors, the conditions are quite stable. I think that is also one of the reasons why we almost never see a broken LT, LT compressor. I think uh, only I've heard about uh, yeah, one or two this year with a bad electrical motor because the conditions are so protected around uh, the freezing compressors in, uh, in our racks. But uh, the big point, of course, is uh, the empty compressor, which is getting all that mixture from the discharge of the freezing compressor. They're getting uh, all the, the gases from uh, the empty evaporators. They're getting the mass flow from uh, the gas bypass valve from the receiver. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, some functions uh, called uh, the liquid injection, uh, where we can inject uh, liquid to the suction side of the empty compressors. And uh, we actually also have a, a hot gas dump function where we can dump hot gas uh, from the discharge side awesome. to the suction side. Yeah. So these five uh, mass flows are getting mixed together. And that is, you can say, uh, the suction pressure is almost uh, stable all the time because uh, all the CO2 controllers uh, we use are aiming for a fixed uh, suction set point. And then it's only the temperature that can uh, deviate. And that is one of uh, the big jokers and one of the things that is really important uh, to look after. The suction superheat cannot be too low and it cannot be too high either. Yeah. Because it is so, uh, especially with CO2 compared, uh, uh, compared to some other refrigerants, if the suction superheat is too low on CO2, the lubrica lubrication ability is getting uh, lower and lower and lower uh, with each uh, drop uh, in value of the superheat. If the superheat gets too low, it have a it have a ability to drag the oil out of the compressor. Uh, how it's working exactly, I don't know, but uh, I can mention we have had uh, some cases 
where, for example, the gas bypass valve have not been working uh, correctly. Uh, we had a time uh, with some controllers where there was was some uh, some wrong components in the, in the stepper driver in the controller, which mm -hmm. meant that the gas bypass gas bypass valve was 100% uh, open all the time. And what we could see, the first thing happened was that all the oil was uh, disappearing from the compressor. So it was actually the low superheat that uh, dragged all the oil out of the compressors. Wow. And uh, that quite amazed me a bit uh, how that was possible, but it is. And then we have uh, the opposite situation that is uh, too high superheat. In itself, it is, it is not that bad. Of course, uh, the higher the suction superheat uh, gets, uh, the less cooling we have on the electrical motor. Okay, that is one point. But the main thing is, especially if we are running in the warmer climates or heat recovery, then as, uh, as we know, uh, a high suction temperature gives a high distance temperature. And that is here where the, oils, uh, where the oil is actually starting to, to, to dismantle itself, so to say. So that is something we are teaching in, uh, in the more uh, supervisor uh, yeah. part of our trainings. Yeah, I really like that because that's some of the things that you really need to focus on. And I love that. And it actually is the first time when I was in one of your trainings seeing it done that way. And I'm sure it may have been done, what you guys have been doing a long time, but going into that vessel to increase the superheat on the line. Before that, what I really liked what you do in your trainings is taking that P and I D uh, diagram. So this is really the piping diagram of their rack of their system and walking through it step by step. And I think that is so important on any system you are working on, starting from the discharge line, working your way from that discharge service valve into if it's a first check valve or if it's a, a muffler or whatever it is to your first valve or your first plate. It's so important to do that step by step. And anytime you do not know what um, component is, circle it down. You don't have to, you're not going to know every component the first time you're going through one of these systems, that's for sure. And even after you go through them dozens of times, there's going to be components. Well, what does that really do? What direction is that flow going? And just circle it and, and don't be embarrassed if you don't know about it, right? This is what we're all here to do, to learn, right? Exactly. I remember um, when I was getting uh, more and more into, uh, into these uh, commissioning jobs, uh, and I think around the time uh, I started, or maybe uh, also some years before, but suddenly uh, the systems got more and more complicated. Uh, suddenly we made the system with the three or four suction groups, maybe with the two uh, LT stages, uh, maybe with two MT stages. Uh, then suddenly uh, the ejector technology came and uh, sometimes it was just a pipe mess uh, without history. That, that you are being presented to. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also for me, it's, uh, it's, it's such an honest thing that, that you need time to learn it. You need time to, you need to take your time. Um, just take the P&I diagram uh, with you into the machine room, uh, plug it up uh, on the wall, go through all the pipings, uh, try to learn uh, where's all the piping going. Okay what kind of uh, valve is placed here and okay, try to figure out, okay, what kind of uh, functions uh, does this uh, different uh, parts on, on the rack have? And then of course, the little, the little bit tricky part can be, okay, how to, to transfer this into the controller, especially mm. in, more, in more complex uh, system where we are taking sometimes some functions in the controller actually meant for some other things and then cheating a little bit, using them yeah. to, 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 to reach our goals. That can be a little bit the tricky part. But then of course, uh, our customers, they, are always, uh, they can always call us uh, for technical support, technical help. We're offering that uh, for free in all kinds of uh, our systems. It's just to call us, then uh, we are much more than uh, willing to help. Yeah, and that's what I love about it. It's all about you know, investing in yourself, take the time as a technician, or if you're an engineer out there, take the time and learn it. You do have some time on jobs. I was a technician for 10, 12 years in the field. There's times when there's downtimes on a job, you're in that mechanical room. 
especially with this new technology, you want to start learning it now. CO2 is already here, but it's going to be coming more and more over the next 10 years. You're going to see full adoption of CO2 in supermarkets. You're going to see them more in chillers, heat pumps, and it's time to start investing now. So get manufacturers uh, manuals. So the compressor manufacturers, the valve component manufacturers, start researching them, learning them, and then go into the equipment manufacturers like advancers and looking up their manuals. You might not be working on this equipment and you may not work on this equipment, you know, but I read your manuals. I'll read Kaiser Warren's. I'll, I'll read Hills. I'll read Hussman's just to give myself a full view of what everyone's doing. So I better my knowledge base you know, and then that makes me more valuable when I'm reading and my knowledge when I'm reading your, your information. And it really, I just tell all the technicians there, you got to invest in yourself and it takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. I've been doing this CO2 learning for seven years. I've been training it for many, for over five years now. And look, I'm still learning from you today. So I love this. Yeah. And that's the same feeling I have. It, it, it takes time. But uh, I really uh, like the point that you made there. Go uh, look, uh, look all uh, the different um, manuals that you can that that you can uh, scrap up from the internet, uh, more or less. Uh, I learned a lot. Just uh, read um, read uh, the Danfoss manuals on the pack controllers. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah around the 130 pages uh, manual. And actually, it was it was here that that some of uh, some of the puzzles really uh, came together for me. Uh, reading about okay, what is the controller exactly doing? Uh, for example, during a heat recovery, what stages uh, do we have uh, to play with, and how does it work in in reality? I remember when I was uh, working as a sales engineer um, at this uh, contracting uh, company. Then the first time uh, I bought. Uh, a rack from Advanza. I asked uh, the salesperson, "Okay, how how is this uh, heat recovery actually working?" Uh, he was he was not completely sure, but it was just something with some signals. Uh, that was uh, fairly easy. But then, when when I was standing on site uh, the first time, I needed to to connect everything. <laughs> I was so uh, confused uh, what to do. Okay. But then, okay, start uh, to look at the manual. And then, uh, of course, I uh, used uh, the ability uh, to call Advanza at that point and, and ask for some help. And uh, luckily, at, at that time, there was, uh, there was already this uh, culture that they were more than willing to help uh, awesome. the customers uh, having all kinds of uh, crazy uh, questions. <laughs> yeah. That, and that's awesome. And that's what I tell technicians, too, is reach out to the manufacturers. I get calls all the time now. Like people are reaching out to me all the time. I'm like, you really should reach out to the manufacturer, ask them questions. And especially from advanced, and I've been on lots of your training, you guys promote support so much, which I really like. You want, you want the customers to call and no question the stupid question if you don't know, you know? So just call and ask the question. They're willing to help. And this is the same with all good manufacturers like advanced they want to help. Because, you know, you want to support the product that you're selling. And CO2 is still something that's really new. It's a, a smaller market compared to, uh, you know, synthetic refrigerants at this point. But I really see that numbers starting to grow. And you need to learn. You still need to read those manuals. So if you call up and you ask a question, how does this electronic valve work? My first question, have you read the manual yet? Because I'm willing to uh, support and I've support lots of people and I will continue to support people but have you read that four page manual and a lot of the times when I did a lot of support when I did work at the manufacturer at, at the end of the call they're like Trevor man you're just such an expert you're ex expert at this topic whatever one it would be I'm like you know I just read word for word out of the manual you know that's it you know so a lot exactly. of times you can get the answer right out of the manual you do have to take the time. I know there's a lot of instant gratification or you skip some pages, but invest in learning the stuff, the equipment before you even get on site. You know, cause I used to, to be honest, I used to learn the equipment while I was at site. If I was commissioning a store when I was first starting out, I didn't notice stuff. Well, while I was working, I'm trying to learn it. But now there's an opportunity where you can get information real easy. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, wasn't as easy to get in manuals like today and get, component information 
So invest that time in learning. And it's just going to make you less stressed on a job, especially working on CO2. Because I get lots of calls from friends like Trevor Moncal, my first time at a CO2 store and there's no gas. So how do I, how do I charge it? You know what I mean? So just right. get that, that basic stuff. And that's not a, you know, that's not a, a stupid question. That's a great question to ask because you don't just charge with liquid into a CO2 system. If there's no gas, you know, you got to start with the vapor, get the vapor up over a uh, hundred PSI, 150 PSI or 10 bar. And then you start adding liquid. So it's, so it's important to really reach out to the support when you don't understand right. something. I totally agree. And, and we must also just say that there's a lot of material available uh, that you can read. So it's of course also to find the, the most qualified uh, material. And also for us, that is also something we have talked about. Okay, how do we make the correct uh, material as easy available as possible? Because we have a lot of manuals, they are quite long. Um, then we uh, quite recently started to make these uh, smaller YouTube clips just with the small, uh, simple for us, uh, mm -hmm. things to do. Okay, how to charge uh, CO2, how to fill oil uh, into a system uh, when you're making uh, the commission how to make a, a proper vacuum, how to test the, the gas cooler. Because one of the things uh, uh, we see a lot uh, in our daily life is, uh, for example, all the, all the racks that we are sending out, they are getting a complete uh, IO test in the factory. Uh, we have uh, power on the rack uh, between uh, half and a full day, where we have some uh, electricians uh, testing awesome. all the sensors testing all the signals, uh, testing everything on the rack. Uh, it's connected as it should be. And then uh, when our customers uh, are installing these uh, racks on site, uh, they just need to install two sensors themselves uh, according to the rack. And that is the two uh, temperature sensors around the gas cooler. Mm. Uh, the ambient uh, temperature sensor and uh, the, the sensor for CO2 out of the gas cooler. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we also made small, uh, small YouTube videos. Okay, how to how to place these sensors, uh, how to test them, how to test uh, the gas cooler at all if the fans are running uh, uh, correct according to the controller. Because I remember uh, just the one or two years ago, we had uh, two or three calls uh, every week. Okay, uh, the rag is running uh, crazy. Uh, the high pressure valve is 100% open. Uh, uh, the compressors are running 100%. Wow. Okay, uh, uh, maybe look at uh, the CO2 sensor out of the gas cooler. And uh, yeah, eight out of uh, 10 cases, that was the issue. It was not uh, placed, uh, placed correct. Okay, that, that is great. Where, where do you place that uh, for everyone? Where would you place that on your gas cooler? Um, it is so that uh, the CO2 sensor out of the gas cooler, uh, we have a standard rule saying, okay, it must be on a horizontal pipe at least uh, 30 centimeter from a bend. Awesome. It must be placed uh, five or seven o'clock uh, on the pipe. And it, uh, one of the important thing, it needs to be mounted um, with a metal uh, clamp, not the plastic strips or, or whatever mm -hmm. you have in the car or the van. It needs to be a good, uh, good product and, th and then mounted with some uh, thermal paste. So, so that you're sure, and, and that accounts for all temperature sensors, um, you need to, to be sure that the value you are measuring is, is so close to the actual value as possible. And, uh, and then of course, to, to, get in, uh, to get in goal uh, with that, you also need to, uh, to insulate the sensor, yeah. Yeah. Uh, put some, uh, something around it so it can handle sunlight, uh, birds uh, picking in it and, and so on. Yeah, and, and that's for any sensor, like you said, it's nothing new. This is not oh, no. new. And the same with uh, uh, TX bulbs. They should all be insulated. But you see in thousands of cases, I've, I've installed thousands of cases, there's no insulation, but every bulb in every system should be insulated. And so every temperature yeah. sensor should be insulated. This is not new. <laughs> this is not new. Exactly. But, <laughs> but, it, but it is also... It is also here we're coming a little bit back. If, if you're not quite sure what the sensor is doing, okay, maybe it's just uh, some other random sensor uh, uh, on the rack. If, if you have that idea and don't understand, okay, what is this sensor actually doing? 
but it is just so so with CO2 that that the sensor out of the gas cooler is one of the most important <laughs> sensors on the complete uh, rack, especially for uh, for the high pressure and the gas cooler side. Now, why don't you explain exactly what and, that that sensor does for it? Uh, it's a good uh, question, and it's actually. It's you actually, don't have enough time uh, in an hour to <laughs> <laughs> No, and it is so that that all the controller manufacturers they have a little bit their own way to do it. But if we should try to to make a standardized uh, uh, explanation of how this works, is that the difference between a transcritical C two rack and uh, and all other condensing refrigerants is that. All condensing refrigerants, at least to my knowledge, is being controlled by the pressure transmitter on the high pressure side. That is uh, here we are controlling uh, the speed of our fans, uh, of our uh, pump to uh, to the water cool condenser or whatever it could be. But it is so with CO2 here that we are here are we always measuring the CO2 temperature out of the gas cooler. And uh, and here the outdoor temperature sensor comes into play because there is some uh, energy savings built into these controllers. So depending on the actual outdoor or ambient temperature, we are creating a set point for the CO2 temperature out of the gas cooler. Mm. In uh, the Danfoss controllers, it is working so that uh, it is uh, running with a calculation of uh, three Kelvin in a Delta T on these two sensors. Uh, so if, for example, we have uh, 8 degrees Celsius uh, ambient temperature, then our set point is 11 degrees Celsius out of the gas cooler. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this to be controlled, the only thing that is controlling this, this is the fans on the gas cooler. So on a transcritical CO2 rack, the fans is only um, regulating after the uh, uh, CO2 temperature out of the gas cooler. And it's the ambient temperature that is giving the set point that the fans are regulating after. And then depending on the actual measured temperature out of the gas cooler, here we are converting that temperature into a set point uh, for the high pressure valve as a pressure set point. You could actually just uh, take a long uh, printout with all the different uh, temperatures uh, that's giving a, a set point in pressure. So if, for example, we have around uh, five degrees Celsius out of the gas cooler, that corresponds to a set point of around uh, 41 bar, at least in the Danfoss controllers, and uh, temperature out of the gas cooler on 40 degrees Celsius, that is giving a set point around 100 bars in the gas cooler. Uh, and then, of course, these controllers, they have some uh, minimum and maximum uh, levels for the set point. Uh, for example, in the really cold uh, regions, or, or actually in all regions, we are having a minimum set point of uh, five degrees out of the gas cooler. Mm -hmm. And the reason we have that is, is so we are ensuring that the condensing pressure at that point are not getting too low, so that we are not uh, killing uh, the receiver pressure and the driving mm -hmm. uh, pressure in the rack. And then here it's a little bit controller dependent again. Uh, but at some point, there is a maximum set point uh, for the CO2 temperature. And that means, okay, at some temperature out of the gas cooler, the fans are just running 100% all the time, 100% speed. And then we're just controlling uh, the pressure on the high pressure valve according to the measured uh, temperature. That was gold. And I hope everybody had their pen and paper out writing down as fast as you can, because that was a perfect explanation on how that sensor works. And that's what I love about it. And that's what I love about learning and talking about it more because it's important to know those fine details because, you know, just those min and max. So I had a time where um, on one of the CO2 trainers I was working on, the, the minimum or the maximum was set too low or too high, sorry. So we're always reaching the point of where we'd go trip an alarm. So we'd shut the compressor, shut the drive down because I was hitting that maximum point too early because it was set to, I think it was 1250 PSI. We had to move it up to 1450 PSI. And then all of a sudden the system just smoothed it right out and it run perfectly. 
And I've seen that lots <laughs> of times on trainers, just scratching your head for like 25 minutes and then you change one set point and you're like, it works perfectly. <laughs> like it just smooths yeah. it out. It's like, oh. Yeah, so that's the understanding those different points, which is very important. If anybody does have any questions, shoot them down into the chat or you can unmute yourself to ask us questions. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you see? Because you sell in lots of different regions. What are some of the biggest challenges that you guys face or that you face as a support uh, line for your, your brand? Uh, so maybe it's uh, education, maybe it's getting the equipment there. What are some of the challenges that you guys see? Um, some of the things, at least that is making the most uh, noise, that is uh, if we... Uh, if, for example, we are designing a new product uh, or just a new part uh, of our product are getting uh, redesigned, and then we think, okay, we have uh, tested this hours and hours, days and months uh, in our lab, but 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 it's really difficult to test the things in the lab because when it's uh, coming out to site, there can be different uh, pipe lengths, different uh, conditions of uh, of all uh, various kinds. Uh, we just had a, an example recently where we introduced uh, ABB uh, frequency inverters. Mm -hmm. We thought all the settings uh, uh, were correct. Everything uh, looked good in the lab. Uh, we could start and stop it, uh, start the compressors and stop them for hours, uh, both uh, in the envelope and out of envelope. Everything was fine. When they came on site, uh, it just started. From uh, from day one, okay, the compressor is not able to start. It's running crazy. It's uh, tripping out on different alarms. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we then we need to act uh, quite fast, and and we also need to quite uh, instantly make um, uh, an organized way to handle handle these uh, mm -hmm. different uh, topics. So uh, that is some of the most uh, so to say difficult things because it can be a difficult problem uh, to solve and it needs to be solved quite fast mm -hmm. uh, because normally uh, we are first to figure this out uh, when people are uh, more or less ready for the commissionings okay that is uh, there's coming uh, goods uh, to this uh, store in uh, five hours or uh, <laughs> one day or something like that i think that is uh, some of the most uh, stressful situations that we can yeah. uh, put ourselves into yeah, no, and I've seen this and I've talked to many manufacturers about it before too, is like you're, you, sometimes you're working with uh, install, installers that have never worked on drives before either. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge there and, and just having that knowledge of drives in general, this is another thing technicians out there are engineers, you need to start learning drives because they're already out there. They've been on compressors for over 20, 30 years, even longer <laughs> But we're just seeing they're being more popular now, and especially in CO2, you're always going to have like a lead compressor with a drive or some sort of capacity control compressor. So you need to understand that technology. And it's good that you guys jump on it when there's an issue to help your customers out right away. I remember sitting on one of your chats that you, you highly recommend it, uh, people checking the oil after, instead of waiting a year, like six months or eight months. You want to talk a little bit about that, what you're seeing in the larger industrial ones on oil? Because oil is something that I keep preaching that more technicians need to learn about because oil is something that you don't see all the time. You only see it when the compressor has no oil or the separator has no oil in it. So you want to talk about that a little bit? I'm quite uh, happy that you asked because this is one of my uh, favorite topics uh, at the moment. When I started uh, in advance, I remember there was some guy telling me I oil, uh, that the oil in the CO2 racks, uh, that was not an issue at all. There was never, never, never problems with oil in CO2 racks. But uh, <laughs> as the years uh, went by, uh, I have just uh, learned uh, the exact uh, opposite thing. The oil is so important. Uh, to these uh, racks, of course, there's something uh, with the running conditions, but especially, um, especially moisture in the systems uh, during uh, the installation uh, period, and also from uh, from uh, the manufacturers. Uh, I just talked to a, a quite large installation company here in Denmark. They had a problem uh, uh, with the cabinets for the stores. 
you know, these cabinets, they are pressure tested with the, with the water. So that if there is some leakage, uh, leakage or, or a failure in the pipes, it's, it's not uh, exploding. But then the uh, procedure to get this uh, water out, water out of uh, the evaporators was not good enough. And uh, they could make a vacuum for 24 hours, 48 hours. Maybe they didn't uh, test, uh, test it uh, with the micron uh, gauge or whatever, but, and also, you know, if you are making vacuum and you have some pockets of water, it will turn into ice and the evaporation from these ice pockets is, uh, is quite slow. And maybe you are not realizing it uh, with your micron uh, uh, gauge that you have this uh, issue. This is actually also one of the reasons that we are always uh, recommending to flush uh, the system with the uh, with a dry nitrogen uh, two times uh, during the evacuation because, because it is so detrimental to the oil quality that you're getting all the moisture and the dirt out of the system. I saw some uh, graph from, uh, from a Fuchs which are uh, making these uh, compressor oils uh, that we are using that just dirt alone, the more dirt that is in the oil, uh, the lubrication ability just goes uh, in, a, in a line straight down yep. And it is so important, and and I really hope that 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 people are realizing this how important it is uh, to the compressors. And uh, coming back uh, to the oil samples, uh, I really recommend that you are taking oil samples, uh, yeah, a period after commissioning, maybe not before uh, one month, but after a month, uh, maybe after the commissioning. Here you have, uh, here you should have the oil uh, mixed with all the contaminants that should be in the machine. Take an oil sample. Uh, it is so cheap and uh, so stupid not to do it. <laughs> a, a compressor for CO2 uh, can easily cost uh, yeah, seven, eight, nine thousand uh, dollars. An yeah. oil sample. Uh, what is an oil sample? Uh, okay, two hundred dollars uh, for yeah. yeah for a good quality uh, oil sample. Uh, it is also a focus point for us. We are starting to dig uh, more and more into this um, because we just see, uh, okay, uh, now we have a compressor that is uh, broken again. Okay, uh, seven years ago, we just uh, sent them a new one. Okay, let's see what is happening. Then uh, maybe two or three uh, years or, or, or shorter period than that. Okay, suddenly now we have a new uh, breakdown. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I exactly seen that. And when I first seen that too, when I was working at the compressor manufacturer, and all of a sudden I was told, "Okay, see this? This is copper plating." Well, what's copper plating from? Well, that's because you got moisture in the system. Well, how do you get moisture in the system? You don't pull a proper, didn't pull a proper evacuation, and you don't see that after week one, month one, or even year one. Sometimes it could be two or three years down the road because of that day one installation. So it's so important to do oil samples. Samples. And this is on any refrigeration system, any refrigerant yeah. you need it, but it's just more important with CO2. And that's one thing that I keep telling all the people I'm training, you know, you know, doing CO2 is no different than any synthetic refrigerant. It's just, we lost the way of doing it properly. You know, not always pulling the proper evacuation, not cleaning the system properly, rushing, not using the inert gas. I've put in so many feet or meters of pipe over the years and didn't use inert gas or nitrogen, no. you know, until I was taught like, or was spec'd actually in the job to, you need to start using this. And I'm like, why? I've been doing it so long without it, but now a POE oil is going to peel away all that dirt and all that carbon and it's going to bring it back, plug stuff up. So oil is so important, nice. everyone. Just like Lara says, you need to understand oil. And I've seen lots of those oil samples as well. You know, it's like, oh, well, it's the compressor. Oh, the compressors don't last like they uh, used to. I heard this so many times, the compressors, and mm -hmm. then from all manufacturers. You know, you think Bitzer and Copeland and Danfoss and <laughs> Durain and all these ones make compressors only last two or three years. No, they build them 10, 15, 20 years. They're building them for a long lasting. But us as technicians are what's causing the issues and failures a lot of the time. Yeah. And I think especially uh, for compressors in a CO2 rack, if they are treated the correct way, if you are making sure the oil quality is high, 
uh, if you're making sure that the compressor's uh, conditions, the conditions around the compressor uh, are in top, then the compressors can last <laughs> really, really long. I was online uh, on a system uh, some weeks ago where the lead compressor MT number one, the compressor that runs with a frequency inverter, uh, the compressor that probably got uh, the bit of dirt in the pipes that was during uh, the commissioning, this compressor had run for uh, for more than 110,000 hours wow. with a frequency inverter in the CO2 rack because it was treated well. If you don't treat a compressor well, okay, maybe you can count on it for three or 4,000 hours or, or whatever it could be. Yep. That's so uh, That's it's just important. And it's no different, just like you said, it's no different than that one that only ran 3,000 hours. It's how you take care of it. And sometimes it's not, you know, the, not getting, it's not always the technician's fault. Sometimes it's the end user who will not do maintenance or preventative maintenance, you know, but our jobs as technician and engineers is to go out and educate our customers on this because at the end exactly. of the day, they might not know, you know what I mean? So make it relatable. Like you go and change the oil in your car. Well, why don't you just check an oil on this $200,000 system you just purchased or, or whatnot, you know, and it's a couple of years in and build that in there and educate them. Exactly. And uh, that is also uh, both uh, us as a OEM uh, producers need to, uh, to push these topics, but also the installers because I know a lot of the times uh, where these systems are getting quoted, then uh, the end user is, is normally also asking for uh, for service price, maybe uh, five or 10 years. That is uh, quite much uh, used here in um, wow. Scandinavia and also in, in Europe. And of course, it's it's uh, it's some estimates and, and includes the basic service, but it's really here that, that uh, you as a company can make a difference. If you are saying, okay, uh, if, if you are able to convince the end user, okay, the maintenance is actually much cheaper than uh, changing uh, compressors. <laughs> of course, it, it's, it's basic, but, but it can be difficult to argue, okay, now we need to, uh, to take an oil sample again. Okay, maybe we need to change uh, all the oil and have a high cost. Uh, maybe the end user thinks uh, he paid uh, too much uh, for the system uh, already. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it no, it's all about education because it's not the you know, POE oil is super expensive. Changing compressors is super expensive, but is that education and, you know, maintenance are so important. I think in CO2 systems, we're, we're going to see, a, I believe, a change in maintenance to supermarkets anyway, because I see, so, I've seen so many supermarkets just let go. You know, they, they went as long as they could without doing a maintenance, try to save money or cut that bottom line. But that, at the end of the day, any time maintenance is way more important than letting things go because it's going to cost you way more in the long run. I've been loving this conversation, yeah. Lars, but we, we should get to some questions here uh, because I, well, I could talk to you for hours on it and we'll probably do this again. So let's start with the first, first question here. Uh, on a TC system, we also need to control the flash tank pressure. Is the pressure also slash always controlled by the same controller which regulates the gas cooler pressure? I think uh, we can say a clear yes to this. I remember when I started uh, in Advanza, I got uh, presented from some of uh, the controllers that was used back in uh, 2008, 2007, where all the uh, technology with the CO2 really started. And uh, back at that time, uh, it was so that uh, one controller was controlling uh, the receiver pressure, the flash tank, and the gas cooler. And then there was another controller for controlling uh, all the compressors, uh, like a normal uh, HFC yep. system or whatever. So normally, yeah, because the flash tank and the gas cooler is so much connected, they are part of the same uh, system, uh, the same job. They need to be controlled uh, together. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Here's another one. The quality and purity of CO2 refrigerant is very important. Apart from the moisture content, which for, uh, form information I could gather should be a maximum of 5 ppm. What other impurities should we pay attention to? In some countries, refrigerant grade CO2 is not easy to find. Can food grade CO2 with a moisture content not above 5 ppm be considered for use? It's a great question. Yeah, if it's uh, only five uh, ppm, I think it's uh, it's more than fine. 
I think, uh, as I remember, uh, the big companies here in Denmark and Europe that they produce uh, CO2 for refrigerants, they are promising that there's not more than 10 uh, ppm of uh, moisture in the CO2. And uh, actually, uh, around the moisture in the CO2, that was a thing that, uh, that I didn't mention uh, before. But one thing you should realize is, uh, let's say you have a system, you're commissioning, you have made the perfect the vacuum. You are 100% sure that there's no moisture left in the oil. There's no moisture left uh, in any parts uh, of the system. Uh, but then you're charging a lot of uh, CO2 into the system, which have some, uh, some moisture content in it. We cannot uh, avoid that at all, no matter how expensive uh, the CO2 are. Um, but here you need to think about, okay, I have already used maybe most of uh, my filter dryer's capacity just for the CO2 that I charge into the system. So in my opinion, it's, uh, it's really important to change the filter dryer after so, a few weeks uh, of, uh, of operation. That is also what, uh, what is um, helping to keep that oil uh, quality uh, up. Yeah, 100%, 100%, you gotta change those filters or even charge it through a filter dryer uh, yeah. when you're charging into the system. So think about that because I know lots of people who that's what they do. They charge it through the fil uh, filter dryer into the liquid line filter dryer. So it's like double filtering. Yeah. You just got to be cautious on what you're doing. Here's another great question. What effect does a bad sensor or a bad transducer have on the CO2 system? And I'm assuming that's the ones we talked about um, for the gas cooler condenser. And how especially, can I test them? Yeah, especially... Uh especially for the gas cooler. Here you can really see some, uh, some crazy things if the sensor is not showing uh, the correct value. Um, one of the things can happen is, uh, is a phenomenon we are talking about in the CO2 business called a gas loop, where you are not able to, uh, to cool the gas uh, properly down in the gas cooler. Then when it enters uh, the flash tank, just create a lot of uh, flash gas that is coming uh, or will come through the gas bypass valve into the suction side of the cooling compressors. And then you just have a loop that is uh, out of control. Uh, at some point, all the oil is uh, pushed uh, away from the compressors and is uh, placed in the bottom of uh, the liquid uh, receiver. Then you need to, uh, to give the rack some uh, first aid. So one of the things I recommend also technicians going into a service job, okay, the things you should look at, the main things uh, from my point of view, is, uh, is the conditions around, especially the empty compressor, uh, suction superheat, uh, what we talked about before, the start and stop of compressors, how many start stop does uh, these compressor have uh, powers. Then go test the sensors at the gas cooler. Just take your normal uh, thermometer, uh, test, uh, okay, what, what temperature do you measure out of the pipe? Uh, and then, of course, uh, the superheat temperature sensor on, uh, on the evaporator controllers, uh, which can cause uh, liquid coming uh, back to the compressors if they are not uh, showing the correct uh, value. These sensors is uh, most important. And then, of course, depending on what kind of sensor it is, uh, you can see different uh, errors. Yeah, I love that. And it, it's nothing new. It's no different than testing a system you've been working on already. It's just I, I feel like... We forgot of all the points we need to check because there's a lot of them. You know, you just got to check them. Your suction, your return gas temperature, your amps, your volts, your discharge pressure, your suction pressure, your, you know, just test them. And I love that. I love that. I don't see any more questions in the chat. If anyone has any questions, they can throw it in the chat or on mute. So, Lars, I want to thank you so much for this. This was awesome. I learned so much today. And I, mean, I know we're going to do this again because you have so much knowledge. Where could people find more about you, more about Advancer, if they want to learn more about uh, your product and your support? For myself, uh, personally, uh, everyone is uh, more than welcome to, uh, to connect with me uh, on my LinkedIn uh, profile. But otherwise, uh, I think it's important to mention uh, that here at Advancer, we have uh, all this uh, training material you talked about, you have been uh, participating in. We are offering that uh, for free to everyone. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that I talked about earlier with the small clips. But then um, if you're going into our homepage, there is a small uh, banner called um, a customer portal. That is a customer portal that is uh, based on uh, Microsoft Teams. 
Here we have uh, all our manuals for all our different uh, racks. We have all these uh, online technical trainings, uh, all the recordings uh, from these. We have them in uh, six languages now, and uh, we will get them in uh, seven languages here in the autumn. And besides that, we will add uh, three new uh, modules to all languages here in uh, here at the autumn. But as you mentioned earlier, the thing with uh, looking in the manuals, here in our customer portal, that is where we have made that possible. Go find all the manuals, training materials. Yeah, I love it. Well, Lars, thank you so, so much for taking the time to spend with me. I really appreciate it. Everyone here really appreciates you and what you're doing out there, sharing your knowledge, training and educating people. And I can't wait to see you at the next CO2 Monday. See you. Thank you for the invitation. That was uh, really an honor for me. I'm just happy to share my knowledge for CO2 and to spread uh, the word for CO2. That is one of my uh, big personal goals. Okay, well, we'll do it together. Awesome. Super. See you. See you. Have a nice uh, evening, everyone. Bye-bye.